Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If you are joining us from beautiful Montreal or from any other locality situated in the Eastern Standard Time Zone, of course, if you're joining us as the members of distinguished panel are from Israel or from Europe, then a beautiful good evening. And I would also like to extend a good early bright morning greeting to our friends who are joining us and calling in from the West Coast, United States in particular. Uh, our event is cross-advertised and cross-listed by the Murray Gallinson San Diego Israel Initiative and a good number of friends have indicated and have registered uh, their interests. So welcome from the West Coast. My name is Chaba Nikolini. I'm professor of political science at Concordia University and also director of the Azraeli Institute of Israel Studies. Those of you, friends, students, and faculty at the Institute who have been following and joining our events throughout this academic year have no doubt heard me say it before, but it's important to reiterate and re-emphasize what an important year this is in the life of the Institute. We are turning one decade. It's already 10 years ago that the Azraeli Institute opened its doors for an informed and academically serious study and engagement of Israel on the campus of Concordia University. And I'm truly proud and delighted to say and keep saying that uh, in this short period of time, we really have grown into something more than just uh, a Montreal phenomenon, not that that's not important, but we truly have acquired somewhat of an international, if not prominence, but, uh, but stature. And our international connectedness is so beautifully exemplified with this event today, as we are bringing together and we are bringing to your screens the um, intellectual achievements, insights, and expertise of bright scholars from Israel, Europe, really from different corners and parts of the world. The event that we invited you uh, to be part of today is a very important one and a very timely one. It is important because it allows me to share a beautiful, very Montreal story as the justification why we are meeting here today. Earlier this year, actually last year, just as we were finishing the, uh, the Fest of Tammuz, um, a dear friend from the Montreal Jewish community, Rachel Alkali, contacted me. And after we discussed how we, how we were doing in the different parts of the world where we were, Rachel told me, that she would like to donate to our student reading room at the Institute, a complete set of Zohar that is uh, going to be bequeathed from the estate of her dear late frat, father, uh, Yitzhak Isaac Alkali. Of course, we immediately said yes. And in order to mark the occasion in the beautiful, nice location that, uh, that we are opening uh, in the downtown campus of the university, uh, we agreed that we would try to mark uh, this very important and very generous donation to our students and to our reading room by actually celebrating the study of Kabbalah, by celebrating the study of the Zohar. One of the important arguments, one of the important theses, if you will, that our speakers will tell you today is how Israeli and how important Israel really has been in making the study of Kabbalah um, a recognized and very important discipline in the universities and, and beyond. And so uh, when I reached out to our colleagues and friends, Dr. Biti Roy, Dr. Noam Zadov, and Dr. Andrea Gondosh uh, to join us in this panel, I was so delighted that each and every one of them accepted. And so in a few minutes, I would like to introduce our speakers, but before we would do that, I would like to turn the microphone and the screen over to Rachel just to say a few words about her late dear father, Isaac Alkali, and the importance of this generous donation to our reading room. Rachel, the microphone is yours. All right. One, I'm impressed that you actually can pronounce Alkali correctly. So you get bonus points from that. I have friends for 20 years who can't pronounce it correctly. So right there, you are on top. Secondly, just so people can see, this is a, photo, a wedding photograph of my parents. So you can see who my father is. So he's not just a name. Um, he was an Egyptian Jew, nine generations Egyptian on his father's side. Um, and I would say we're Sfaradim, he'd say, no, we're Mizrahim. And of course he was right, right? We were not from Sepharad. We were always in Egypt. Before that we were apparently from Israel under the 
Ottoman Empire, I think, at that time. My father was, um, we were from Israel. We came to Canada. Um, things didn't necessarily work out here, but he was a very, who he, what he worked at is not who he was. He was very much an intellectual. He was a big reader. He knew history. He knew politics. He knew religion. He knew things about history sometimes that people who are more well-read didn't know. And he had many, many religious books and the Zohar, he had the Zohar, which unfortunately I think he didn't discuss with other people. You know, he read it on his own. He didn't discuss it, which was a real pity, but at least now people, at least the books now will go to a place where I hope they will be read and appreciated and they will know who gave it and, you know, that he existed and that he gave something. And I've got to thank for the donation also, for the idea, Janice Rosen, the archivist at the Canadian Jewish Congress Archives, because I tried desperately, I hadn't thought of the Israeli, I tried desperately to give it to various rabbis I know, and nobody would touch it because it's controversial, this particular version. They wouldn't touch it. I thought, what am I giving them? It's What kind of poison is this? And I was speaking about it with Janice and she goes, why not the Israeli Institute with Chaba Nikolaini? And I said, I know Chaba, this is so wonderful, a university thing. So thank you, Janice. Thank you, Chaba, for accepting this. And thank you everyone for participating. My friends who came from Israel, from Toronto, from Montreal, really it's appreciated. I'm sure my father is enjoying this from up his Beautiful, thank you so much, Rachel. And uh, thank you for the credit about the pronunciation. Believe me, with the name that I have, <laughs> uh, I, I better be able to pronounce uh, any kind of first and last name. Um, there is also a very important justification for why we are holding the event today, now that we know why the event in the first place. And this I need to credit uh, or give the credit to uh, Noam, who pointed out that uh, yesterday on the 21st of February was, of course, uh, the your site of uh, Reid Gershom Sholems, and we're going to be hearing about him and about his legacy in a few minutes time from, uh, from Noam himself. Um, and so those of you who are actively engaged and following um, news and discussions in the Kabbalah world, uh, I'm sure you've been seeing the different posts and the different tweets <laughs> about this important uh, anniversary and all the various events and activities that are being organized, not just here, but also certainly in Israel to commemorate it. And so, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, without further ado, let me share uh, a brief introduction about each member of our panel. And I would like to do that in the same order in which I asked them to, uh, to deliver their presentations. The presentations will, of course, follow a thematic and chronological order. Um, and there are going to be more about this will be said in just a few minutes. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Noam Zadov, who is professor in Israel studies at the Department of Contemporary History at the University of Innsbruck. Noam's book, Gershom Sholem, From Berlin to Jerusalem and Back, was awarded by the Concordia University Azraeli Institute Award for Best Book in Israel Studies in 2018. In 2018, we actually organized the award in collaboration with the Montreal Jewish Public Library and those of you who were already attending our events and the gala might remember Noam who personally uh, accepted our invitation and came to Montreal to receive the award and also gave a seminar the day after on our campus. Noam also edited the Hebrew correspondence between Gershom Sholem and Joseph Weiss and also wrote a biography of Sholem's which is forthcoming uh, later this year with the Zalman Shazar Center Press. Our second speaker, and Noam, not surprisingly, is going to be telling us about Gershon Sholem and his foundational legacy in the study of Kabbalah. Our second speaker is Dr. Andrea Gundersh. She is a postdoctoral research associate in the Eminota Research Group on Knowledge Circulation, working with Dr. Agatha Palu. Andrea is examining questions of sexuality, gender, and emotions in magical recipe texts produced in early modern Ashkenaz. <laughs> Andrea's first monograph was titled Kabbalah in Print, the study and popularization of Jewish mysticism in early modernity. In this book, Andrea examined the literary structure and cultural impact of Kabbalistic reference tools and their role in mediating and popularizing Kabbalah in early modernity. I'm proud to say that Andrea is an alumna of Concordia University 
where she studied the history of Kabbalah under Dr. Ira Robinson, who was also a very, very active member of our Azriel Institute of Israel Studies. So it's really uh, wonderful to see our uh, Kabbalist, so to speak, from Concordia being part of uh, this discussion today. And our third speaker is a dear friend and colleague from uh, Jerusalem, Dr. Biti Roy. Dr. Roy has lectured at both Bengal U University of the Negev as well as at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Currently, Biti is teaching at the graduate program of the Schechter Institute in Jerusalem. She is also a senior fellow of the Kogod Research Center for Contemporary Jewish Thought at the Shalom Hartman Institute. Biti's field of research include medieval Kabbalah, the book of the Zohar, Kabbalah during early modernity, as well as Hasidism, Kabbalah and gender, and the relationship between Jewish mysticism, myth, and ritual. I'm also delighted to tell you that Biti's book, Love of the Shekinah, Mysticism and Poetics in Tikkuneha Zohar, was awarded the World Union of Jewish Studies Prize for best book during the years of 2015 and 2017. Our first speaker, uh, Noam, is going to introduce the panel with a discussion of the foundational legacy of Gershom Sholem, followed by a presentation given by Andrea, who will tell us about the important legacy of Isaiah Tishbe, Gershom Sholem's first and very important student. And then finally, Bitty is going to bring us up to date in terms of the current giants of the uh, Kabbalah research and the Kabbalah discipline in Israel uh, and beyond. So uh, Bitty is going to uh, tell us where Kabbalah is today and where it's heading. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic and the screen over to Noam, then Andrew and Bitty. I asked each presenter to speak for no more than 20 minutes so that we would still have time for a Q&A. Ladies and gentlemen, please keep yourself muted so that we would be able to enjoy without any interruption and disturbance the uh, intellectual uh, uh, treat that we are going to be partake of. Noam, take us away. Thank you. Thank you, Chaba, for this uh, very kind uh, introduction. It's always a pleasure to be here, uh, there, that is in at Concordia University, even if virtually, no? Um, um, and today, as you mentioned, Chabai, today we commemorate 40 years to Gershom Scholem's death, no? And this is a good moment to reflect upon uh, his legacy uh, uh, and his merits uh, uh, and perhaps also and uh, faults uh, uh, while um, um, founding uh, the, the field of research of Kabbalah. So the question or the main question that I want to start with is how come that 40 years after his death, no, he still uh, um, um, uh, incites the imagination uh, um, uh, of researchers, intellectuals, and uh, interested persons in not only in, in Kabbalah itself, no, uh, but also uh, in his own personality. And I think this is, uh, from the one hand, it's rightly so. As father of Kabbalah research, uh, he is responsible for creating this field, not for the beginning of interest in research in Kabbalah. No, this happened already before Sholem, but he was the one who turned it into a whole academic field. And he himself, in his research, touched upon almost every uh, aspect or every period of time uh, of Kabbalah uh, research uh, at the time. Now, afterwards, we will see uh, when the discussion will come to Idel uh, that there were uh, gaps there, of course, to be filled. But if we look at, in general, about periods of time, his research began uh, with uh, uh, ancient Jewish mysticism to the beginnings of medieval Kabbalah, the Zohar, afterwards, um, the uh, uh, Lurianic, the Kabbalah of the Ariya, we'll come back to that in a second, to the Mess to Messianism, Shabtai Tzvi, Hasidism, uh, um, and so on and so forth. Um, that is also a bit about uh, contemporary mysticism, but he didn't regard, he didn't see it as a, as a worthy field of research. Um, but still, um, the question stands, and it's, wh what is this magic? Why is this combination uh, this kairos created by Sholem starting in the field of Kabbalah that is uh, really attracting us, uh, attracting people uh, until today. So my answer to that would be that actually what is uh, 
or at least for me, what is always interesting is the tension. The tension that Sholem created between himself, his personality, his ambitions, his personal ambitions, and his research. And the way he saw Kabbalah, and one of them, the way he saw Kabbalah on one hand as a historical phenomenon, but at the same time as a living human phenomenon that uh, was relevant to uh, here and now. No? Um, so while reading Sholem or while looking at Sholem and, and, and his, uh, uh, his um, uh, research or in his, this great endeavor, um, I think that very often we have to look against the grain you know, and to see um, what were the hidden intentions also, not only, but also uh, in, his, uh, in his research. Or maybe they were not that hidden, but they were, didn't have directly some the, um, or connected directly to Kabbalah itself. And first of all, I think is um, that his research was not only not only um, pure scientific, as he very often declared, but it was as he sometimes also admitted also ideological. Gershom Sholem was a Zionist, and his research, Kabbalah research, or the beginning of Kabbalah research was a Zionist project. That is, through research, Sholem aimed to, um, um, to build or to put a stone in more than one stone in building uh, um, the return of uh, Jews into uh, th their land, no, the land of Israel. This was the reason why he made Aliyah, and as a contribution to that, uh, he um, devoted himself to also to Kabbalah research. And this is, I think, very often was seen as something negative to say about Sholem, but I think at a certain point, we all in our research have uh, also ambitions beyond our research. No, none of us is just uh, um, an, an, an orchid, no, who's just staying there and, and, and doing um, the research on the sake of its own beauty, but we all have ambitions. We all want to achieve something in this world. And I think that Sholem's achievement was, Zion, it was um, um, Zionism. So on the one hand, he rebelled as Zionism was uh, a, a rebellion, a rebellious movement. He rebelled as well against the um, past generation of uh, researchers, that is the Wissenschaft des Judentums, the German Wissenschaft des Judentums of the 19th century, where he recognized uh, the tendency, the social tendencies of apologetic. And against this apologetic, he wanted to build a new, uh, the field uh, as bringing to the front all those irrational or um, not so not so pleasant uh, not so pleasant phenomena to the bourgeois ear um, um, that would, according to him, really moved uh, um, or where the force moved behind uh, Jewish history, especially in modernity, especially in the process of coming out of the ghetto, and I'll uh, get to that in a second. But this rebellion, this um, historiographical rebellion, was parallel to the uh, actual historic rebellion uh, of Sholem's generation against the generation of the fathers. So what was the narrative of Sholem? This narrative he uh, uh, actually presented uh, fully and completely in his book, Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism, uh, which, which was published in 1945. Um, uh, sorry, 1941, apologies, 1941. And then there he moved Kabbalah from the margins of Jewish history to, this, to its center. That is, the narrative, especially of the modern time, is starting with the expulsion of Spain, that is, as a, as a traumatic event that started to move something geographically, uh, but also uh, uh, intellectually or religiously uh, among um, um, Jewish or major Jewish rabbis and personalities. And then this expulsion, um, or through this expulsion, um, there was a, a messianic seed was sown uh, in the ideological Jewish world. And this happened through the Kabbalah of the Ari of Safed in the um, um, 16th century. And this Lurianic Kabbalah, um, 
made uh, I, we cannot we have only i have only uh, a couple of minutes left so i i cannot get delve into that but uh, it opened the 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 door for a coming of the Messiah, of a messiahs no and according to sholem through this door and through the uh, widespread of the teaching of the luriani kabbalah um, through this door came subtitles fee uh, um, into uh, the, on the stage, no, and Subtitle's V uh, appearance on the stage happened uh, uh, as against the background of those of this trauma, uh, and um, through a very interesting uh, combination of uh, the, his uh, personality, uh, Sholem recognized uh, um, um, as a psychological disease. He diagnosed it as a as a bipolar personality, which fit very well to the theology of Sabbatianism. And this combination brought to this messianic expectation that was like Christianity uh, 1000 and 600 years before that uh, was uh, ended in disillusionment and this disillusionment broke of of the sub of the um, um uh, of the messiah subtitles we converted to islam in 1666 and this disillusionment brought to a break in the monolithic orthodox jewish world and to this process of coming out of the ghetto sholem recognized three uh, movements that came out of this um, uh, of this break of this uh, um, 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 trauma or this uh, critical moment, uh, Hasidism on the one hand, Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment, and Reformed Judaism. So all those movements he saw their origin in the uh, uh, Sabbatean trauma. Now, um, Sholem saw in this Sabbatianism case that is in the heart of this narrative stands the Sabbatean movement, and he saw in it. Uh, uh, an attractive phenomenon, that is, um, Sabbatianism was uh, hugged and adopted by Zionism as a movement that is calling to activism, that is not being passive, but uh, actually bringing uh, the Jewish redemption. Uh, in Herzl Altneuland, when um, in Haifa of, of, of the time in 1923, uh, in the opera of Haifa in his utopic Altneuland, the opera that was playing was Subtitle V, you know? So he really uh, um, um, inspired the imagination of many uh, uh, Jewish intellectuals and writers. Uh, but on the other hand, he warned against the dangers that the messianism could be. That is, what is the price that you pay for your messianic hope? And here comes his special uh, conviction of Zionism, which is what was Ahada Am, was a, a cultural Zionism of Ahada Am. That is, he didn't see in the state, in, in the existing of a sovereign state, uh, the, the true uh, fulfillment of Zionism. Actually, he saw a danger in that. And for him, Zionism or the, 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 the fulfillment of Zionism should be should have been a creating a cultural center in Jerusalem. Of course, the historical events, you no, know, the, the Nazi uh, come to coming to power and the Holocaust that followed it um, changed this whole situation. But he was still very aware of the dangers that uh, um, that Sabbatianism posed. Another point was that Sholem uh, interpretation in, in Sabbat, from Sabbatianism or in the Sabbatian case was the borders or the definition of who is a Jew or what is Judaism. That is, by taking, by adopting the Sabbatian heresy and bringing it historiographically into Judaism, into Jewish history, then he expanded the borders of Judaism. At the book Chapter Tzvi, the Hebrew version, page 230, he mentioned that uh, what is the, uh, the essence of Judaism, this is something that we cannot define. That is, every generation, in every generation, Judaism is being defined by the people of the time, by the Jews of the time, Shlomei Emune Israel, in his uh, in his words, no? And this definition was explosive. This definition was controversial and it played part in the Kulturkampf, in the cultural wars uh, that took place in Israel at the time, in the 1950s, 1960s as, and on. And his position there was very clear, maybe clearer than it seems to us until now, but it was also consequent in that sense. So this is uh, another, ten one another tension and there was 
another tension as well that I want to add to that. And this is the between the personal search within Kabbalah, researching Kabbalah is also, and Sholem saw it that way as well, is also a personal internal research or search after uh, a certain uh, religious uh, uh, goal, no? And <clears throat> there is a tension between him being a German, German scientific, scientific uh, academic, no? On the one hand, and on the other hand, looking for um, the truth or some kind of a religious truth beyond the veil of history, that is the belief that in Kabbalah there is a, some eternal truth that uh, you can, one can discover, and this is, was one of his aim. And this is also something, a line that is discernible throughout this whole work, and maybe this is also something that he bequeathed to his, some of his uh, students uh, on, the, uh, 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 on their own path or uh, in, in researching Kabbalah or the Zohar by looking at the same time, uh, um, standing or adhering to uh, very strict scientific um, 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 uh, standards, but on the other hand, also um, performing a personal research in the texts. This we can see very well at the, in, in how the, the, the book, his book, uh, major trends in Jewish mysticism ends. No, uh, we uh, commemorate today or the 40 years to Sholem's death and how is with numerology, you can always find uh, a hidden meaning. So last year, we celebrated 80 years to the publishing of major trends in Jewish mysticism. So it's very fitting. I think both 40 and 80 are numbers with which we could really do something. Um, so I'll just quote from the end of the book, and, and, and you see that how this small quote also reveals uh, this uh, tension. This is how major trend in Jewish mysticism 1941 ends. Of course, the year is important here. And I quote, to speak of the mystical course which, in the great cataclysm, now steering the Jewish people more deeply than in the entire history of the exile, destiny may still have in store for us, and I, for one, believe that there is such course, is a task of prophets, not of professors. That is, looking at this time for a deeper meaning, a meaning in which all and believe that it exists, is a task for prophets and not professors, and therefore it's not in the book, but is not excluding himself from those who try to find this meaning. So the magic of Sholem is unfolded in the story of the acceptance of his book, of this book and all his other books, and that inspired many scholars, uh, and yet with which so many scholars really wrestled. No? So major trends in Jewish mysticism is really could be, uh, 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 is regarded today as the major text uh, um, or the first, probably the first recommendation that you would give to someone who wants to understand a bit more in Kabbalah. And here I come to a, something that puzzles me, uh, and I don't have an answer to, but I think it's a good point to uh, end my presentation, that although that this book is still considered to be um, so central, although actually many, not to say most, of the central assumptions of Sholem in the book were refuted, by his uh, scholars, by his pupils, by, by colleagues, scholars, and by his uh, students, and by the students of his students. And I can give here a partial list of these topics, just um, that you see how many there are. No, uh, for example, the period of time in which the Hechalot liter literature, the ancient Jewish mysticism, was written, uh, was proved to be not the one that Sholem thought. It was the importance of mystical union in the Kabbalah of the Kabbalist with God. Uh, in the literature of Kabbalah uh, um, um, has have shifted, the, that is the understanding, the influence of Gnostic idea on the book Bahir, on the Lurianic Kabbalah and Judaism in general. Uh, the Gnosticism has proved to be uh, not really a movement, historical movement, but more an idea, let's say, some say 20th century uh, construction. No, um, the spread of the Lurianic Kabbalah in the Jewish world before Shabtai Tzvi, uh, which is uh, in doubt if it was so widespread as Sholem thinks, the neutralization of the messianic idea of Hasidism, 
and uh, seeing Hasidism as actually is the last phase of mysticism. So every one of these assumptions has proved in, in excellent, highly scholarly uh, and really based and grounded researches of very uh, uh, central uh, and inspiring scholars to be not true. But nonetheless, this is still the central book in the field. And two years ago, or, three, or 2016, I think, a bit more, five years ago, uh, a Hebrew, for the first time, it was really translated into Hebrew. So um, this here, here we have it in a nutshell. That is, the greatness of Shnolem state, although the generations of his students and the students of his students have developed and contradicted most of his assumptions uh, um, uh, in, the, in, in the field of Kabbalah. Uh, and this is probably uh, or mostly the best way that a field of research could uh, develop. You know? So uh, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Noam. Perfectly timed and what an excellent point to, uh, to end the presentation with, but really it's uh, just opening uh, the rest of the panel and of course the continued engagement. So thank you. So let's turn the mic and the screen over to Andrea. Thank you very much to um, the Israeli Institute of Israel Studies, to Chaba, Lisa, and Corey for arranging this wonderful conversation amongst uh, colleagues on the development of Kabbalah. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Arya Tishbi, uh, um, Isaiah Tishbi's son, who has always uh, been so generous with his time and sharing materials with me beyond the, the, the Tishbi archives. Uh, as well as being very patient uh, as I nag him with questions and clarifications about his father and, and his father's life. Without further ado, let me begin. On November 9th, 1964, Sholem returned to Israel from abroad, only to find Isaiah Tishbe's newly published book among a pile of other books, which prompted him to write the following letter. Dear friend, upon my return to Israel from abroad, I found among the books waiting for me here also your book, The Paths of Faith and Heresy, published in 1964 in Ramat Gan. I was elated to see this collection, an important contribution to research in a field in which both of us have been plowing for years. I bless you on the publication of your book and also on the nice format in which it appeared. May it be, Yehi Ratzon, that all your other research to which you have alluded to in your introduction should see the light precipitously and add new layers to the history of Kabbalah, Sabbatianism, and to the fruitful debate. I lament the parting of our hearts that emerged between us, and I admit I cannot easily resolve it. But may this not detract from the fact that I admire your brilliant talent and success in research and scholarship. And who am I to enumerate these? With true respect, admiration, and kind regards, Gershom Sholem. What emerges from this letter is a sense of respect between Gershom Sholem, the renowned professor of Kabbalah, and one of his first students, Isaiah Tishbi who by this time was also a recognized and eminent scholar of Jewish mysticism. Sholem alludes here to a sense of kinship signified by the image of plowers, workers of the field, the field of Kabbalah, that only yields results when one tends to it regularly, plowing deep into the material, sowing the seeds of ideas, and finally, reaping and harvesting the intellectual fruits in the form of books and articles, which ultimately reach the general public. The letter also hints at sadness, a breaking point between teacher and student, which nevertheless did not impact the profound respect and admiration Sholem felt for his student. In uh, parentheses, I would add, perhaps um, this suggests that uh, when there are common passions and common interests, then individual differences between people can be overcome. As I poured over several letters in preparation for this talk, it became clear to me that Sholem regarded Tishbi as the second in command to himself. 
their extensive correspondence between 1955 and 1957 reveal that Sholem invested Tishbe with a number of responsibilities when he left to spend a year in the United States at Brown University and the Jewish Theological Seminary. In his absence, he put Tishbe in charge of supervising gra graduate students, teaching classes on Kabbalah in his absence, and overseeing the, the general management of Kabbalah instruction at the Hebrew University. He also appointed him as the section head of Kabbalah and Jewish philosophy on the organizing committee of the World Congress of Jewish Studies that was to take place in Jerusalem in 1957. It is particularly moving to hear Sholem bless his student with the phrase Yehi Ratzon, an unmistakable allusion to traditional Jewish liturgical language. But let us return to the letter and the image of flowers. Beyond the metaphorical reading of this image, Sholem and Tishbi shared a common Zionist sentiment toward the land of Israel with its often messianic overtones, which I would like to elaborate on now. For both mentor and student, immigration to mandatory Palestine in 1923 and 1933 respectively was bound up with an overall utopia of revival, political, national, linguistic, intellectual, and personal. Sholem and Tishbi were part of a group of prominent intellectuals who emigrated from Europe and to a lesser extent from North America to mandatory Palestine in the first decades of the 20th century and have come to shape modern Israeli cultural, intellectual, and even political discourse in significant ways. As Moshe Hidal has argued, Zionism replaced traditional religious discourse, but nevertheless functioned as a type of secular utopia for a group of 20th century intellectuals who left various corners of Europe in order to settle in mandatory Palestine. This group included Gershom Sholem, Isaiah Tishbi, Chaim Nachman Bialik, Yehuda Ben Shmuel, Ben Zion Dinur, Joseph Klausner, Yuda Magnus, Jacob Talmon, and Aharon Ascoli. Ascoli. These thinkers and scholars shared the deep-seated longing for redemption and renewal sentiments often expressed by the subjects they set out to investigate in their intellectual pursuits. I'm just gonna show this picture with Sholem and Tishbi together. You see the Tishbi on the, on the right side. In contrast to Sholem, who came from an assimilated German Jewish family and regarded Zionism in more cultural rather than existential terms, Tishbi was brought up in a traditional Orthodox household in a rural area in Transylvania and viewed Zionism less philosophically and more as a politically and existentially, as politically and existentially vital to Jewish continuity. As Noam Sado's recent book uh, posits, Sholem became disappointed in the Zionist project as early as the mid 1920s, not long after his arrival in Palestine, which is hinted at in the, in the uh, subtitle of Zadob's book, From Berlin to Jerusalem and Back, denoting the ambivalence Sholem felt both toward his new home and the old country, Germany. Zadov repeatedly underlines that Sholem never really left Berlin and maintained both an intellectual and an emotional tie with his German origins. Tishbi, unlike Sholem, regarded Zionism not as a failed experiment from which one can extricate oneself, but saw it in more messianic, albeit secular terms, as the return of self-governance to the Jewish people in the ancient homeland. Born in 1908 in a small village in Transylvania in sunny Slow, no, um, Tishbi grew up in an Orthodox, but not a Hasidic household and received traditional rabbinic education. Following the Orthodox educational program, Tishbi continued his studies in yeshivas in the Transylvanian towns of Notykaroy, Sotmar Nemeti, and Hunyad. His nonconformist attitude toward the Orthodox way of life becomes accentuated during his yeshiva years and found expression in his passionate pursuit of Zionism. After World War I, Transylvania, an expensive and historically important region in Hungary, was annexed to Romania following the Treaty of Trianon, that reconfigured the map of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. Tishbi explains that Transylvanian Jews 
now under Romanian rule, but lacking any nationalist sentiment toward the new government, found Zionism an attractive ideology that replaced their earlier Hungarian patriotism. The foremost cultural catalyst for disseminating Zionist ideology was the newspaper New East, or Uikelet, which was published in the intellectually eclectic and vibrant Transylvanian city of Cluj or Kolozsvár. In his early 20s, Tishbi moved to Budapest, where he felt a sense of displacement and existential alienation in the industrialized capital. In his book of poetry called Song of Dark Moments, a collection of poems he wrote and self-published in, in, Hung in Hungarian in Budapest in 1932, Tishbi devotes several poems to contrasting the bucolic mood of the countryside of his youth with the menacing darkness of the city of, of city life in Budapest. The poems reveal an acute sensitivity to human suffering, the social ills of urban industrialization that created a society of a marginalized working class struggling to survive and earn enough to eat alongside the glittering salons and cafes frequented by the wealthy. In this work, Tishbi presents himself less as a Jew and more as a displaced human being whose voice is universal as it cries out against social injustice. Jewish topics are not overtly engaged as the general narrative of the poems evoke longing for the family, the warmth, the warmth of the distant hearth, contrasted with the human decay, social alienation, and collective decline that the poet witnesses in his immediate environment. Tishbi's brief sojourns in Budapest and later in Vienna as a writer, journalist, and Hebrew teacher further cemented his resolve to leave the European continent and fulfill his long awaited desire to set out toward the East and contribute to the revitalization of Jewish life there. Born as Sandor Schwartz, Schwartz Sandor, his early poems and other journalistic contributions that appeared in various media outlets have already signaled a marked shift in his self identification as a Jew. With a subtle invocation of the famous Hungarian poem on Elijah's chariot by the celebrated symbolist poet, Endre Odi, he dramatically associates himself with the biblical prophet Elijah by changing his name to Elijah, Illesh in Hungarian, Tishbi. Embracing the zeal of the prophet and no longer content with the bourgeoisie salons of Budapest, he finds his calling as a Jew in the return to the ancient land and language of the Jewish people and immigrates to Palestine in 1933. From then on, Tishbi's scholarship as a researcher of Kabbalah, as well as his later poetry are defined by a devotion to the Hebrew language and Jewish intellectual revival in the land of Israel. And here we see a picture not long after his arrival in Tel Aviv. Tishbi summarizes his attitude towards Zionism in an interview that was conducted between himself and, uh, and Ariel Tishbi uh, many years ago in the following way. I remember one poem that was published or perhaps left unpublished called The Song of the Messiah. The truth is, he says, that this poem was written about my own messianic visions in my childhood. I had all kinds of ideas to be a kind of messiah even as early as 1921, after the bar mitzvah, after his bar mitzvah. When the difficult political events unfolded here in Palestine, I sat and dreamed about what I could not be, about why I could not be there and why I could not do something between the Jews and the Arabs. I mean, I had all sorts of pretensions in this matter. I wrote this poem about myself because I felt I was the Messiah. The name Elijah the Tishbite is connected to the Messiah. The figure of Elijah the prophet shows that I first chose Giladi. He went by the name of Giladi and sometimes Tishbi. And then Tishbi. They were messianic musings on my part. Today, the name is no longer messianic. Changed his name to Isaiah rather than Elijah. But Elijah heralds the coming of the Messiah. 
Certainly that was my interest. My Zionism was Messianic Zionism. This is without a doubt. It is also explicitly expressed in the speeches I gave. It was Messianic Zionism. And I felt that even if I cannot become the Messiah, I can still be the herald of the Messiah, the one who paves the way. Emigration from Transylvania, the old world to mandate Palestine, or in his words, Zion, was the beginning of a redemptive drama at the personal and professional level in Tishbi's life. Zionism provided a remythologization of Judaism. Secular creative pursuits in the form of poetry offered an alternative medium for the construction of the self. Return to the ancient homeland replaced the family hearth, the family house, and the study of Kabbalah in parallel fashion offered, in the words of Moshe Idel, to redeem the redeemers, which is an act of redemption, not only for those forgotten redeemers, but also for the academic redeemer in the present, who participates, albeit only psychologically, in the historical redemption drama that he is describing." End of quote. Tishbi studies at the Hebrew University with Gershom Sholem, Hugo Berman, and other emigres from the old world who had not long before joined newly established departments of the university, opened up new intellectual horizons for him. Here I have a few photos, um, certificate presented to him by the Karen Hakayemet. And the establishment of the Hebrew University in 1918 and the subsequent opening of the Mount Scopus campus in 1925 were conceived of as transformative events marking a new momentum in Jewish history. The renaissance of the modern secular Jew, who with their return to the ancestral land, renders an offering not on a stone altar or sacred temple, but within the secular walls of learning and on the pages of scientifically written books. Perhaps it is not by accident that the Hebrew University is located at one of the best topographical vantage points in Jerusalem to view the place where once the ancient Jerusalem temple stood. In probing the speech of the American professor, Max Margolis, the first visiting fellow at the newly inaugurated Institute for Jewish Studies at the Scopus campus at the end of 1924, one can detect clear religious overtones drawn from, the tradi drawn from traditional Jewish belief. Quote, this place in which we stand, Mount Scopus, from which we can see the remnant of the temple is a sanctuary for us. This edifice and the other that will rise in the not so distant future will become for us a holy place. Judah Magnus, tasked to become the first chancellor of the Hebrew University, similarly intermingled religious tropes with a programmatic call to adopt the tools of objective science in his dedicatory address to the Institute. And he says, a holy place, a sanctuary in which to learn and teach without fear and hatred, all that Judaism has made and created from the time of the Bible, end of quote. For these Jewish scholars born and educated in disparate corners of the European continent, the inauguration of the Hebrew University was framed in a utopian framework of gaining the freedom for self-definition moderated by the selective adaptation of received traditions from the ancient past. As Moshe Dal highlights, academic investigation of this generation of professors as compared to earlier attempts abounds in questions pertaining to messianism in Jewish history, which leads him to posit that Zionism and messianic thinking are categories more imbricated for these scholars than had been previously suggested. As so many Jewish intellectuals who had emigrated from Europe to mandate Palestine in the early decades of the 20th century, Tishbi was also personally affected by the devastation of the Holocaust. His first book, The Doctrine of Evil in, Lur uh, the Doctrine of Evil in Lurianic Kabbalah, uh, published in 1942, begins with a dedication to his parents, to father and mother, imprisoned in the realm or in the kingdom of Satan, 
yearning for imminent redemption. Two of his siblings, Leah uh, and his uh, uh, Leah, his sister, and Shmuel, his younger brother, managed to survive the Holocaust. The parents died in Auschwitz, and their letters to Isaiah provide particularly poignant insights into the role of Zionism as both a revitalizing and a divisive force among the Jews in the refugee camps shortly after the end of the Second World War. Arising from a predilection for mythic consciousness, Tishbi, like Sholem, was drawn to symbolism as a mode of interpreting and understanding both mystical texts and reality, and saw the deployment of creativity as a potent force in his own writing and scholarship. Influenced by the French symbolist poets, Charles Baudelaire and Stéphane Mellarmé, who were mediated in his youth by the powerful verse of the Hungarian symbolist poets of the 20th century. Tishby's first book on the doctrine of evil in Lurianic Kabbalah is a nod to symbolism and denotes his first academic project. The French symbolist poets frequently explored the questions of spirituality, sin, and evil, and the publication of Baudelaire's Le Fleur du Mal, Flowers of Evil, marked the preoccupation of the symbolists with human sin and fallenness. The influence of symbolism on Tishbi's writings invokes uh, Mircea Eliade's emphasis on the salience of this movement in 20th century thought. Eliade says the following, it is beginning to be realized that the rediscovery of symbolism is perhaps the most important discovery of our age. The prevalence of symbols in the history of mankind and for the development of the human psyche is also a central preoccupation for Carl Gustav Jung's important work, Man and His Symbols. Taking up the popularization and dissemination of Kabbalah constituted the second stage of his academic focus and resulted in the completion of his work Mishnat HaZohar. I will come back to these. In 1949, in his work, he reframes the medieval Kabbalistic classic into a more manageable text, arranged topically and translated into Hebrew from its Aramaic original. The organization of information by topical headings facilitated greater access to an otherwise difficult and enigmatic text. His subsequent collaboration with Lackover further widened the readership of this paradigmatic text of Kabbalah by translating Mishnat HaZohar into the English language. Finally, the third stage of Tishbi scholarship is encompassed by his study of Rabbi Moses Haim Lutzato, his circle and his poetry, his reception history, published posthumously in 2008 by Littman Library of Jewish Studies, which he framed within a broader discourse on messianism. That the creative impulse never left Tishbe completely is attested to by the publication of an anthology of poems in 1972 entitled Sparks of Darkness, Shiv A. Alata. By this time, Tishbe was already a celebrated and respected scholar, yet what was important for him in the publication of this volume was to prove to himself that he still had access to the creative impulse that constituted such an integral and defining facet in his youth. He says, I thought that I was no longer able to write poems. Through my scholarship on the Zohar, I managed to transmute my poetic urges, yet in preparing the anthology, Sparks of Darkness, I realized that I'm still able to not merely reproduce a primary text, but also to create poetry, an original text, from nothing. Nevertheless, I no longer have the urge to write my own poems, as I consider the academic work before me to be more important. Since I opened with a letter from Sholem, I would like to close with another epistle from the teacher master to the student disciple. This letter highlights their common passion for manuscripts. One of the undisclosed and hidden secrets of academic study of Kabbalah is that the real treasures are not found in the printed works that everyone can buy and see. <clears throat> but in the thousands upon thousands of manuscripts scattered across libraries and private collections in the world. While printed books present often homogenous and uniform narratives and ideas, manuscripts show a messy world, a kind of scribal workshop where earlier traditions encounter later adaptations and where textual fragments are reworked and represented in new ways. 
the sheets or folios of the manuscript bear witness to the personalization of knowledge by the scribe or scribes, whether that information was transmitted to him in a written or oral format. As such, the study of manuscript is an often manuscripts is an often overlooked but crucial element of the study of Kabbalah. And here I would like to mention Professor Daniel Abrams, who was at the forefront of uh, bringing um, manuscript studies back into Kabbalah through um, the journal that he founded, um, uh, Cheru Press, as well as I'd like to call out um, uh, Dr. Agatha Palouk, with whom I've been working for the last two years and who opened up for me the treasure trove of magical um, uh, manuscript and recipe books, uh, which opened a whole new world for me. In this letter that I will finish with, Sholem identifies the tension between Kabbalistic printed works of Rabbi Abraham Azulai, uh, late 16th, early 17th century Kabbalist, who included passages from other manuscripts in his work, Hesed Le Abraham, printed in Amsterdam in, nine, in 1684. Sholem responds to a letter Tishbi sent him, asking for assistance to identify the source of these passages. Sholem's response not only identifies the source um, as the work Elima Rabati, written by the famous Kabbalist of Safed, Rabbi Moses Cordovero, which was extant only in manuscript form, but Sholem also underlines that consulting diverse manuscript witnesses, sorry, I'll just keep going, will allow for a comparative analysis of textual sources and for the emendations he made over a 50 year long career that shows that a Kabbalah scholar is also a kind of detective looking for clues, investigating and comparing textual witnesses to trace and track the movement of ideas, letters, words, and passages. And this is what Sholem says. In 1981, one year before his death, Sholem writes, esteemed friend, I'm grateful to you for sending your article that explores the Kabbalah of Rabbi Abraham Azulai in relation to the teachings of Rabbi Moses Cordovero and the Ari Rabbi Yitzhak Luria. In it, I have found a number of convincing textual emendations that were published alongside other things that require deeper study. Over 50 years, I have made corrections in endless places. Since then, my book appeared, Kabbalistic Manuscripts, and what was written there was based on what was published and on subsequent investigations that I undertook in the study of manuscripts. It is not surprising, therefore, that much to my great joy, today it is much more convenient to browse this dispersed material of manuscripts. Joseph Levine's book on the manuscripts held at the British Museum, which came out five years after my book was published, allowed me to amend specific issues already at the time, since many of his ideas were based on what I had already conveyed to him orally in conversation. Concerning the citations in the book uh, uh, of Abraham Azulai, titled Hesed Le Abraham, from the Kabbalist Rabbi Moses Cordovero, which are not found in his printed works, it seems to me that much of it was taken from Mayanot and the later Tamarim sections in Cordovero's book, Eli Marabati with thankful respect, Gashem Sholem. As this letter highlights, manuscripts reveal another history, a subterranean one where the personality of the scribes, the passage of historical events, the transfer of ideas are gleaned from the unique composition of the manuscript. Philological changes, shifts in the use of symbols and symbolic language, all signal points of transition and demand the Kabbalah scholars' attention and scrutiny. Cholem provides here a succinct definition of his Ars Poetica that underscores the importance of manuscripts and the development in the field of Kabbalah. I would like to close by saying that manuscripts are not marginal, but pivotal in understanding the development of Jewish thought, history, mysticism, and any study thereof. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for this fascinating uh, continuation uh, of the discussion. I'm sorry about the inconvenience. Maybe you were yes. channeling something uh, mystically. Yes. There's so much mysticism going on, of course, in the discussion. Uh, if I could ask you, please, to stop sharing your screen yes. so that we could turn the screen and the mic over to our third panelist, Dr. Biti Roy, uh, who is going to continue in the same vein of bringing us up to date. Uh, in the fascinating world of uh, Kabbalah research. Uh, Bitti, uh, the screen is all yours.
hello everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Chava Nicoletti. Thank you, Lisa and Corey and Rachel Alkali and uh, my dear colleagues, Andrea Gondosh and, and Noam Zadov. So we have come to the third part of this evening, which actually uh, I will deal with the, with the, with the secret of, um, of, of the field of Kabbalah in Israel. Uh, when I entered the university, the Hebrew University in the 90s, uh, no one could imagine that this field is going to have, uh, I think, the most uh, students of research in the master and thesis and, 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 and PhDs, uh, students, uh, you know, going over Maimonides, going over uh, New Ages. Uh, I, did, I did a little survey, not uh, scientific, but uh, with the head of uh, departments in Israel in the universities, that Kabbalah is really a, a very, very strong field in Israel, a, a very compelling to many people, to many students to come and study it. I would, uh, I, I would like to uh, take this uh, into account when we talk and to ask the question, what is the magic of the research of Kabbalah in Israel? And if uh, time will uh, allow me, I will also elaborate a little bit about the connection between the academia and the culture, the music, and other things in, in Israel that has to do with Kabbalah. Uh, uh, but how, how it happened that, that uh, this film is so successful, uh, how it happened that uh, one of the most uh, prominent periodical in Israel uh, is Kabbalah of uh, Professor Daniel Abrams, that I see him here in the uh, audience. Um, how did it happen? And uh, this is a, a very big uh, question. And I want to share with you my assumption, uh, actually uh, giving a credit to uh, two of uh, the prominent professors of Kabbalah today uh, in, in Israel. Uh, both of them retired already, but that paved the way to what we see today, this kind of inflection in, in studying of Kabbalah, uh, which will be my beloved teacher, Professor Moshe Idel and Professor Yehuda Libes, uh, that I'm going to, con to concentrate today about their, their contribution to, to this uh, research. I, uh, I want to thank uh, both Noam and uh, Andrea to pave the way to me because I'm going to speak about uh, the new directions, that's uh, one of the name of uh, a very uh, a breaking through uh, article of my uh, Professor Yehuda Libes and also about the very um, a famous book of Moshe Idel, New Perspectives. Both uh, uh, use the word new, uh, saying uh, that they are coming with a new way or new directions for the research of Kabbalah. I will focus about two ways that they saw their new uh, directions or perspective. One of them is uh, understanding uh, um, Kabbalah in, its, uh, in the history of the Jewish people. And the other one would be about mythology, uh, uh, moving from the historian philological mythology of, of uh, Gershom Sholem uh, to a different mythology, which I will call it right now, uh, the mystical methodology, the um, uh, psychological methodology, the technical methodology, I will, I will uh, uh, elaborate it on, on, on um, later on. So here we, let's start. I, I want to start with a, a, this. And Moshe uh, Idel and Yehuda Libes, some uh, are describing them as, as uh, the fox and the hedgehog. Yehuda uh, Libes uh, known as, is known in Israel as the uh, one who is actually um, uh, made many, many people being in love with the Zohar, including myself, um, very central on the text of the Zohar. And uh, Moshe Idel uh, speaking about models uh, uh, of, of the broad picture of, of Kabbalah. I'm not sure this is the right description, but let's, let's stick to it uh, for a minute because Yudali was also right about literature and Greek and Arabic and, and uh, Gaon Mivilna and Hasidism. Nevertheless, he is known by uh, his ability to uh, put a lot of scholars 
and uh, into the, the, the Zohar fields, specifically the Zohar. So here we find these two uh, prominent uh, articles, a new perspective and what Yehuda uh, wrote about the directions, the new directions of the Zohar. And I want to move uh, to the historian understanding of, of, of Sholem, uh, the Kabbalah, and uh, actually speaking about Kabbalah is a revolution in the Jewish tradition coming a, almost from nowhere, Gnostic influences uh, in the Middle Ages, but there actually um, it has a conflicting relationship with rabbinism, with ration, rationalism, and a coming to say something else, especially from, from a rabbinic um, way of thinking about, about Jewish life. Uh, Sholem saw a rabbinism as a legalism, as a dry legalism, that actually rabbinism uh, conquered the myth, which he described as the underground streams of Jewish tradition that has this vitality of erotic, tenatic, uh, sex sexual understanding, methodology, mythological uh, um, um, passion for the Jewish tradition and that the rabbis actually suppressed this, these elements uh, where he comes to actually expose, uh, expose us to what have been suppressed and what have been neglected for, for so many years. Seeing the Kabbalah as something uh, completely, a uh, completely new revolution. As opposed to this, uh, Moshe Idel and Yehuda Lewis, I will talk uh, about them uh, like uh, one entity. Um, spoke about actually, and, and also in their research, they wanted to explore and to actually define the continuity between rabbinism and the Kabbalah. Uh, actually to say that also in the Talmudic uh, writing, uh, the legalism is uh, not dry, but rather we have also uh, inside the Talmudic uh, writing, um, a, a lot of mythology, mythologic, Le, uh, elements like Leviathan, Kerubs, God wants a human being to give him a bracha in Masechet Brachot, uh, the, the entity of the Shechina, the, uh, our ability to see the midot of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, attribution of God, all this actually uh, in, a, in a very long, uh, for decades, Moshe Idel and Yudha Libes uh, taking a lot of efforts to actually to expose these elements and to see how Kabbalah is actually grounded in the rabbinical uh, thinking, not to speak uh, uh, about the, the myth in, in the Bible, but actually that the Kabbalists develop the new ideas that a, a, is shaping a Jewish a life and thinking from their a, antiquity. So this is one aspect that is very uh, important to put put on. I think that I think also that many uh, I would say observant people or traditional people find this too a uh, uh, this this a uh, way of of uh, research a uh, uh, freeing to say that a. Uh, um, we find integrity and we find integration inside the Jewish tradition between rabbinism, Bible, Talmud, and Kabbalah. And this is not something that came from outside agnostic, uh, maybe heretical uh, uh, thinking, but actually uh, uh, creates an, a much more uh, integration inside the Jewish uh, uh, tradition. This is one, one thing that I want to say. I think that uh, for decades they explored it and showed uh, us uh, in the many, many articles uh, the continuity uh, between rabbinism and Kabbalah. Also to say that uh, uh, claiming that Kabbalah actually uh, was developed in its earliest stage from trying to give a, a I would say, reason, a meaning to the dry law, that most of the Kabbalistical uh, writings in the earliest time of Kabbalah, even before the Zohar, are trying actually to, um, to give much more meaning to uh, 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 the mitzvot, the commandments, and that this is actually the starting point of Kabbalah. Uh, and to add for this, that many of the Kabbalists themselves were uh, people of halakha, uh, some of the, the main figures like Haraived, of course, Nachmanides, the Vilnagon, 
uh, Rabbi Yosef uh, Karo, uh, you know, other people that actually the uh, Kabbalah in rabbinism is not conflicting, but rather has this kind of trying to, um, to overload and to bring life to, uh, to the legalism that described by them as the framework of Kabbalah. Um, Halakha is the palace of the myth. This is one um, quote from uh, Yehuda uh, Libes. So this is one, uh, one thing that I want to elaborate today. The other one is to say that um, Moshe Edel and Yehuda Libes actually rejected the understanding of, of Kabbalah as, as um, something that needs to be under the research, the, the, the research of history. This is not to say that they weren't, they, they, they didn't say, uh, saw themselves as historian, but they thought that uh, Sholem puts a too much, uh, too much uh, effort to um, describe Kabbalah in its historian framework. Um, actually, we can say that uh, Sholem succeeded in showing how Kabbalah influenced the Jewish history and that how Jewish history influenced Kabbalah. But they wanted, after this framework was done, was, was a, a put into a, a, like the, the first assumption of the research to say that they're interested also in other things, not just the historical uh, elements of Kabbalah, but rather its experiences sides its technique size, its mystical experience size, we can see um, in uh, most of, of Moshe Idel's books, um, uh, the word ecstasy, the word, the word magic, the word experience. Uh, we can see here, uh, you know, the golem, we can see here the golem, it's actually elaborating on, on on a sugiya in the Talmud that two rabbis brought up to life a human being. Uh, that either in this uh, fascinating book shows how this, this element comes from the Talmudic period going, developing uh, in its uh, Kabbalistical uh, line till, you know, uh, literature and, uh, and kibernetic studies and science and and a cinema and, and film, whatever, uh, universal. But this is just one uh, idea, speaking about a uh, Saturn, speaking about astrology, speaking about ecstasy, speaking about mystical experience, uh, uh, seeing Hasidism in its, uh, in its uh, if you want to uh, purify what's the essence of Hasidism, speaking about experience of vocal rights, uh, we can see, we can study in this uh, very, very short uh, presentation from the titles of the books about the, uh, the revolutionary way they show Kabbalah. Here we find Moshe Idel uh, speaking about uh, interviewing and saying, I'm interested not to emphasize elements of transform this literature into, into I, I'm interested in my research to emphasize the elements that transform this literature into mysticism, not to describe when somebody lived and when somebody died, if he wrote X number of books or Y number of books, uh, these things are without a doubt important and then they have been dealt with, but he's interested in some, something else. What is the experience of, of the Kabbalists? This, why is it, is it so important? Because it's actually a, a modified, a different view on, uh, on, the, on the phenomena of, of Kabbalah, uh, speaking about, um, speaking about uh, the inner life of the, of the Kabbalist and seeing the Kabbalist not restrained to the timeline of history. I would say that here I, I, I can define the differences between difference between Moshe Idel and Yehuda Lebes. Moshe Idel think that the library of the Jewish people is very broad and very open. And actually that the Kabbalists can sit, I'm, I'm relating to uh, the, the lecture of Noam Zadov that we heard, a, a, Sholem described mysticism as in a timeline, in a linear timeline, which every phase of it is in continuity and a response to the phase before. In that way, Idel uh, uh, and both uh, Yehuda Libes says, you are restraining Kabbalah to this framework of history, 
whereas the Catholics were much more free, Ide, because the, the library of the Jewish people is open. And then we can find Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, you know, going back to uh, Sefer Aziel Malach, and uh, we can find Hasidism, not relating all the time to Shabtanism, but going farther to a different thing, to Eichalot and speaking out about Aliyat Neshama. So actually the mystic is not, is not abundant, is not, a, a, is not a tied to history, but rather a, a, the Jewish tradition actually is open. And the openness of the Jewish tradition uh, fits to the way he wants to make the research of Kabbalah. Whereas Yehuda Liebe speaks more about the inner life of the mystic. The inner life of the mystic is something that sometimes can uh, win or conquer the historian framework that Sholem wanted to put upon him. For example, if we take uh, Rabbi Tzchak Luria, the Ari, uh, for Sholem, he was a kind of a messianic figure, and he was interested in his theology, breaking of the vessels, looked to Sholem very appealing to the idea of, of the, uh, I would say, tanatic and a rebellion way and a subversive understanding of Jewish tradition. Uh, the Shvirat Akilim, the breaking of the vessel, or the Tzimtzum, that we draw God from this, from this uh, reality, which actually uh, for Sholem was the big thing of, of, of Luria, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, Kabbalah of Luria, saying that God withdraw himself from, from reality uh, because it's a, it's a, it's a remnant to, uh, to the Spain uh, expulsion. Uh, and God is, is uh, with us in this. For Yehuda Libes and, and Moshe Idel, the Luria uh, writing is not so much about these historical frameworks of Kabbalah, but rather, as Yehuda Libes points out, um, Ari was very interested in giving all kinds of, of remedies, tikkunim, yichudim, to his disciples in his, in his um, uh, uh, close, a, a friends and disciples and students a, dealing with Gilgul Neshamot, dealing with the, with the souls and thinking about a, a creating a better life a, in their own and not so much the big history frameworks that, that a Sholem saw. By the way, for a, a Moshe Idel, the messianic idea that actually uh, painted, Sholem painted the entire Jewish uh, Kabbalah uh, history, uh, especially from the 16th century, to say that the messianic idea actually is the, is the prism that we need to see the entire movement, 16th century coming with a messianic idea, with a tikkun, with the breaking of the vessel. Saptanism is coming with a messianic idea of Shabtai Tzvi. Hasidism is respond to the messianic idea of Saptanism and naturalize, naturalizing it uh, uh, from, from being because of the fear of that, as I think Noam spoke about it. Uh, actually for them, uh, no. Uh, as Moshe then points out in, new, in a new dispute, um, um, no, Ari uh, didn't speak about one word about the Spain expulsions and not about the Messiah. And this is not the discourse, the discourse of how to preserve the Spanish uh, jury. And uh, this is not the essence of uh, Lurianic uh, uh, writing and uh, uh, Kabbalah. Um, so they want, they want, both of them wanted to move the research of Kabbalah from the historical philological uh, writing to a, a more phenomenological uh, research that dealing, uh, once uh, Moshe Idel described it as a toolbox. You can take psychology, you can take anthropology, you can take sociology, you can take, Yudha Libes speaks a lot about the self-conscious of Luria, how he describes himself, how he sees himself, how Rabbi Nachman sees himself, how the Gaon Vilna sees himself as the core of us to understand what they are writing. And, and actually in, in, um, in suggesting this as a tool of research for, for their understanding, Kabbalah makes a, a, becomes more clear and more um, um, integral 
with the text itself, not to uh, impose on the text something that's coming from outside, the linear Hegelian way of, of thinking about the Jewish, the Jewish uh, history. Um, so um, uh, another, another dispute that is very interesting that uh, actually uh, is, is going uh, now, I think it's the second direction, it's second decade uh, between Elliot Wolfson, I think one of the prominent scholars of Kabbalah in America and the, the Jerusalem uh, school of Moshe Edel in Yehuda Libes is about the, the, the place of feminine and femininity in the Jewish, Jewish Kabbalah tradition. And this is another uh, thing to, to speak about showing uh, for, for his understanding that the feminine is always a, a secondary and a, um, he sees the Kabbalah as a phallocentric way of thinking about, about the feminine where they see it differently. Another uh, example that I want to bring is about very interesting uh, research that uh, Gershom Shalom, both Gershom Shalom and Moshe they later on develop about the Star of David. And um, uh, as, I, as I showed before, Idel is very interesting about, interested about the magic aspect of Kabbalah where Sholem, because he wanted to be part of the discourse of his time in Aranos, in a comparative religion, uh, wanted to move Kabbalah to more philosophical, theoretical, uh, maybe Jungianic archetypes to speak about symbols, uh, uh, to fit the discourse at that time. Uh, Moshe Idel, as he described it sometimes, uh, one time, I lived in Romania. He lived, uh, uh, came to Israel when he was a teenager, um, but he, he definitely said in Romania, people spoke about ghosts and they could speak about ghosts that running in, on the roofs of the night. So the magical aspect of the Jewish Kabbalah is very, very prominent and he's not afraid to speak about it. Uh, and maybe um, Sholem was much more reluctant trying to, uh, to establish the film to make it sense to other people. So if we compare the research of them both about the Star of David, um, we found that of course, uh, Sholem knows that Star of David uh, um, uses magical aspects of, of holy names that was written on it and he described it, but nevertheless, First of all, he's very interested in the Zionist understanding of how a humiliating symbol becomes the, the symbol that the Jews are proud with. But uh, he says that the linkage between magic and, and theoretical Kabbalah is very weak. This is one of his quotation there. Whereas a, a Moshe Idel is trying to show in a very, very strong way the magical aspect of Star of David's, of David. Um, I'm, actually, I finished my speaking about them both, you know, uh, I would add that uh, they are anti theologization of the Kabbalah. Both of them see theology as something that is not, is not, um, is not the right uh, way to deal with, with a Kabbalah. Kabbalah is not a theology, Kabbalah is not an abstract ideas. Uh, they see Kabbalah as a life experience that has to do with commandments, with the body, with performance, with techniques, with experiences, with the inner life. And uh, that's what they want to, um, if, and one, one time, I, I think, Andrea, you showed the wisdom of the Zohar of Tishbi, a very well-known population of, of uh, Tishbi that we're all using. It's a, it's a, it's a great book. Uh, so once uh, Yehuda Libes says, it's not the wisdom of the Zohar, it's not Mishnat HaZohar in Hebrew, but rather it's the Zohar of the wisdom. This is what I'm trying to say, not to say, okay, we open the book, we see what the Kabbalists thought about creation, what the Kabbalists thought about God in the world, what the Kabbalists thought about redemption. This is not a theoretical uh, framework, but rather an experiential and uh, a life experience that has to do not with theory, but rather more with emotion, experience, techniques, and, and so, so on. I, I, um, I move forward. I don't know, uh, Chaba, you tell me how many minutes they have. What's, what's the time? 
you are just a little bit over time, Bitty, but it's so fascinating. So maybe if you can take another couple of minutes to wrap it up, that would okay, be okay. So I'll do I'll do it ideal. I'll do it in a very quick, quick very quick way. Uh, I wanted to show you uh, we celebrated not not long ago uh, the 50th volume of uh, this uh, uh, periodical in Israel, Kabbalah. Uh, that uh, that say uh, open up for Kabbalistic texts like uh, Professor Daniel Abrams, the founder and the founder of the publication Crew Press, and I spoke about how uh, how it's it's uh, so uh, important today this periodical. Um, I want to move on and to speak about new trends in Israel regarding the uh, Kabbalah. I'm moving from the academic uh, per se. I just spoke about you know a, a I don't know. A lot of many many students that follow the way that uh, was paved by Moshe Idel and Yehuda Libes, and if we are going from from the acad academia, you know, from Mount Scopus up down to earth in the Israeli experience, I would I would just um, I would just uh, notion for um, a few direction. One is the the traditional ultra orthodox Kabbalah. Uh, that actually, as Idel defines it, they are very uh, uh, narrow in their interested uh, in Kabbalah. Some of them went to uh, Ramchal, some of them went to the Rashash, some of them went to the Gaon Mivilna, uh, not seeing like the academic broad uh, view of Kabbalah uh, as as uh, Sholem put it, Nahon, uh, many streams of Kabbalah, major trends in Jewish mysticism, it's many trends and, um, and, um, and other. The other one is Kabbalah uh, for, for the population of Kabbalah, Bnei Baruch, that becomes a very prominent in Israel, uh, follows uh, Berg in America, opens up for many, many people, uh, seeing Kabbalah in a new age idea in, as, as a science, as, as a is um, uh, giving uh, answers to everything and knows everything. We're speaking about the question of Kabbalah. They're speaking about the absolute uh, uh, truvot and answers of the Kabbalah. Other one is that the Kabbalah of Rav Kook that became a very, very prominent in Israel, the establisher of uh, Gush Emonim, the nationalist uh, uh, Orthodox in Israel, um, that actually, uh, takes a lot of the um, ideas from Kabbalah and created um, a theory, a way of life about God in the history, about us uh, participating in the God's, uh, um, God's decisions in the history and, uh, and seeing God as part and imminence in history, uh, all uh, based on uh, Kabbalah. We see the big yeshiva of Merkaz Arav in, in Yerushalayim that um, he established. Another way is a modern orthodoxy is a, is a whole path of, of studying Kabbalah, not in the academic sense. Uh, for example, Zohar Chai, this is a, a, a layer's house for people who wants to study Kabbalah, just for the sake of Kabbalah. Um, Otniel Yeshiva, Siach, Machanaim, and more, all concentrated in studying Kabbalah, they hold shiurim, courses in Kabbalah. You wouldn't think it, it's happening, but Rabbi Steinzalz, uh, people here that, this is Yeshivat Otniel, holds two people that uh, teach Kabbalah, El Hananil teach Kabbalah and write about Kabbalah. And another uh, thing that I want to talk about is, is about, in Israel, Israeli music, singing Kabbalah, singing uh, parts and texts from the Zohar, like Eviatar Banai, uh, this is a uh, singing Aramaic, Aramaic songs, Shotea uh, Nevoa. You see, they they sold twenty thousand copies in Israel. That's a lot. Singing uh, a piece from the Zohar, uh, Victoria Hanna, a very interesting performance art, uh, uh, singing Sefer Yetzira. Chaviva Pedaya, professor in the Ben Gurion University, writing uh, poetry and uh, prose. Uh, she is the granddaughter of of Yehuda Petaya, which was a Kabbalist in Jerusalem. You can see his pictures if you go by Machne Yehuda in many, many stores. Uh, created a, also a play lately was, uh, was um, played in Israel. And another journal, poetry, uh, that by the name Ashiv Haruach, also a very a double name, a double name a, a title. A, describing themselves as a Jewish, you can see here, periodical for a Jewish Israeli poetry, um, 
all actually bringing seculars and religious people to write poetry uh, that is based in some ways and a, a phrase some way, sometimes in Aramaic, uh, things from the Zohar. So what is the connection between the academy, the field of academy in Israel, and this uh, kind of cultural um, uh, phenomena in Israel is a, a different uh, thing to uh, research. I just wanted to give a broad sense of how Kabbalah became such a great um, research field in Israel academically and how it penetrated and, and uh, made its way to uh, Jewish uh, Israeli experience for current days. Thank you uh, very much in a brief and a little bit of taste of uh, this uh, thing that needs to be much more elaborated and in much more time in a different time uh, framework. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bitty. Uh, thank you, Bitty, Andrea, Noam, for this uh, intellectual tour de force, really a sweeping overview of uh, of this um, tremendous uh, richness that characterizes uh, Israeli intellectual life through the uh, particular prism of uh, the development of a whole new discipline. Of course, not a whole new knowledge, but a whole new academic uh, discipline uh, on university campuses. Uh, let me invite members of the audience to drop any questions, comments they would like to put to the panelists in the chat box. I will try to do my best uh, to uh, be a fair moderator and relay um, at least as many as we will have time for. Um, I would say that we have about 15 to 20 minutes for a Q&A. Um, our guests are joining us from Israel and Europe where it's already getting later in the evening. And we certainly don't want uh, uh, to have Bitty or Andrea lose the light or have more uh, evil or undue Kabbalistic influences interrupt um, uh, interrupt uh, their um, uh, their environment. To get maybe the conversation started, I would like to abuse my position as a chair of the panel and host to maybe put a couple of questions uh, to you. Uh, the first one is a very practical question. Let me just ask you to please uh, uh, mute yourself. Uh, that's great. Uh, um, Bitty, you, you have told us and painted a picture of uh, a Kabbalah, um, a state of Kabbalah that's not only well, not only healthy, but is extremely well and extremely healthy in Israel. Classes are popular. You mentioned that when you were taking Kabbalah and no doubt it continues to be much the same way. These, this is a popular subject matter. And now Kabbalah is making a tremendous impact and influence beyond the academy, as you showed us on the last couple of slides, music, poetry, and so forth. What's the story in Europe and North America? Um, Noam and Andrea, can you, how would you respond to this tremendous effervescence and richness of uh, Kabbalah that Bitty told us about in Israel? Do we see, of course, different realities, different Jewish communal realities in Europe and North America? But would you say that Kabbalah is all doing well and in good health uh, in these uh, different parts of the world? So that's one question. The second question I would like to put to you has to do with Messianism. Both Noam and Andrea told us about the importance of Messianism to both uh, Sholem, the scholar and the person, and Tishbi, the scholar and the person. When Bitty, when you told us about Idel and Libes, uh, messianism was there on the book cover and messianism was there as a historical phenomenon category that they problematize and seemingly reject. Um, why is that? Why is messianism seemingly gone as a personal, if it is, as a personal conviction of the current generation of Kabbalah scholars or is it really gone? Is there room for the kind of personal messianism that characterized Sholem and Tishbe as scholars and people for that to come back and be present on campus? Naturally, as you mentioned Rav Kook and you mentioned other um, uh, Gdolim in the, uh, uh, in the religious world, but university scholars, uh, are they as, can they be as comfortable with messianism today as Sholem and Tishbi could? And finally, uh, and I know it's a lot of questions, but I would like to pick up on something that Noam opened with. 
uh, or close with rather. The canonical reference to Kabbalah, or to a novice beginner, is major trend in Jewish mysticism. We've heard today about the wisdom of the Zohar. We also heard about great books by uh, Idel and Libes. If we have all these new, more recent, fascinating works, why is it, and I'm not sure that there is an answer to that, why is it that wisdom of the Zohar, yes, it's read, but it hasn't replaced major trends? Why is it that new perspectives, yes, it's read, but it hasn't replaced major trends? So why is it that Sholem still has this tremendous uh, holding and staying power? So take whichever you would like in any di direction you would, uh, I would like to give each panelist an opportunity to respond to my um, attacks or invitation for uh, continued intellectual engagement, and then we'll turn to the audience. So uh, maybe in the same order as you presented, Noam, if you want to pick up on any of the points, by all means, and then Andrea, and then Viti. Yeah, sure. So, so, so let, me, let me pick up on the point of messianism for a second. No? Um, I think that the warnings or the reasons, or let's say, if... If, if, if one would ask if I dare to say what would Sholem say if one would ask him now about messianism, uh, then my assumption would be that, that he would say the dangers of messianism, what I warned of in messianism, was fulfilled politically in today's Israel. That is, the, the, the entrance of messianism to the political sphere in Israel religious messianism to the political sphere in Israel um, changed uh, in many ways um, the course of Zionism. That would, I would say, that would be my bet what Cholim would say, no? Uh, and therefore, um, he would, he would see, he would think or see that his warnings, his early warnings, uh, were um, unfortunately not in vain in that sense. No, and one of the interesting questions that um, others asked before me is how come, in many ways, students of Sholem, many, not so, not so few, turned to the messianic uh, extreme right. Now we talked here about uh, um, Yehuda Libes, who is a supporter of the settler movement, an open supporter of the settler movement in the West Bank. But there are other students about whom we didn't talk, like uh, uh, Rivka Schatz Oppenheimer, who was part of Gush Emunim, the Gush Emunim movement, and uh, um, um, uh, um, also, um, yeah, now the name escaped my mind. But it will come back in a second. Uh, Yosef um, Ben Shlomo, maybe. Yosef, Yosef ben thank Shlomo. you very much. Yosef Ben Shlomo from Tel Aviv University. Thank you, Pete. Um, uh, who has also lived uh, um, in, a, in a settlement. And this is, those are, the, a question has been asked, no, by David Ohana, especially, uh, um, the historian David Ohana. Why, uh, how could it be, no? And there, although there is no one answer, but one can assume, or the assumption is that this narrative uh, of of symbols of believing in symbols and this messianic narrative is very powerful no and we all in a way search in the research or look in our research not only for its beauty but also for answers for our lives for the uh, our existence or its meanings no so therefore i think that um, messianism uh, is still very much alive uh, uh, but it went beyond the academic sphere. You know? uh, it's also important to say that several of Sholem uh, students went to the, to, not to the radical, but remained on the left. So it's not like, it's not so one-sided. You know? So that would be my take on the messianism. Now about the last point of the, what is really the power of major trends in Jewish mysticism, it is a good question. No, I and I think it it can also we can also leave it open. It's a fact that it's it it's a canonical text, as you rightly said. No, and Moshe Eder's uh, Kabbalah new perspective builds on major trend. No, it's new perspective to what? It's there. Those are the new perspectives to the what Sholem defined as major trends. No, and what 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 Edel defies there is the idea of major trends. No, to say the, the, this choosing of the major trends is, is a choice, is a deliberate choice. 
those per probably or maybe, uh, as uh, BT uh, said, not not the major trends of uh, mysticism. We have also uh, um, experience. No, we have also magical techniques. All those things that Cholem did not touch upon, and now it all comes and uh, fills in the picture, in that sense. No, and I think this is the sense of 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 his first book of, of, uh, of Kabbalah, New Perspectives. Since then, of course, uh, Edel developed it uh, and, 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 and wrote many other books and, and built a building of his, of his own. But just as Sholem's building is st stands or on uh, the Wissenschaft des Judentums of the 19th century as a contradiction to it, Edel builds on uh, um, Sholem's uh, uh, project and develops it further, just as, he, just as Liebes does it and so on and so forth. And what I see so powerful in the text of Sholem in Major Trend, it's that it is beyond its academic value. No, that is, it is, it has a, a, a kind of something of a pioneer work that even if the work itself had been refuted, still this structure, this building is so powerful that it, that it stands there. And this is the first reference that one would give to someone who wants to learn more about Kabbalah. And now I'm done. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Noam. Andrea. This was very interesting, Noam, what you were saying about uh, the appeal of major trends in Jewish mysticism. And I think one of the attractiveness of the volume is that it's sweeping. So it provides a fairly neat picture about the development of Kabbalah. And I think what happened in the generations uh, after Sholem, Idel, Libes, I think more you know, generations before us and our generation is that we have come to realize that Kabbalah is messier than how it is presented in major trends in Jewish mysticism, that we have realized that the devil is in the detail, that we find um, problems, uh, areas of contention uh, as we delve into the minutiae of the text. When we look at, for example, manuscript witnesses, and you, we see that the picture that was drawn in um, in larger narratives like major trends of Jewish mysticism doesn't really pan out. So when you go deeper, it you realize that you have to be more particularistic rather than general. That and, and that's what we have become. Everybody is going deeper into the material and 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 rather than going um, taking a, 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 a larger breath, we're going deeper into the material. And that makes us into more specialists, but I think that um, that we're presenting perhaps um, a more carefully constructed picture about uh, ideas, about um, what's in, in, in the text, in manuscripts, how ideas um, circulated and traveled. So I think we get um, uh, perhaps a truer picture. The, the other thing that I wanted to comment on is, is perhaps tied to, to what I just said, perhaps not. And that is, I find that Kabbalah studies, and that's perhaps a, a slightly worrying trend, um, especially in North America, is becoming um, somewhat marginalized and, 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 and becomes more elitistic. And I was just talking to, um, to a colleague recently who said, somebody told me why, you are an intelligent person, why are you studying Kabbalah? So there's this, this sense that, that those who study Kabbalah, it's something that um, we cannot study with the scholarly tools that are available in other fields of Jewish studies, such as history, such as political science, such as um, um, literature and other fields. And I think that this is where we need as scholars to move forward is to, to adopt more the tools that are used in, in other fields of study, contextualize Kabbalah, frame Kabbalah more in more contemporary questions, such as questions of gender, such as questions of, um, of phenomenology. So what kind of practices can we learn from from certain books. Um, magic is certainly an area that can be opened up further. Uh, and so I, um, 
So these are some of the questions that I think uh, need to be uh, developed and, and, uh, and rather than often being lost in, um, in the text in front of us, bring the text to dialogue with larger questions, with historical questions, with, 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 with questions that material history, for example, technology. Um, so bringing it out of the elitist field of philosophy um, to, to uh, inquire from the material that we have with new questions. Thank you, and I pass, pass the you, word. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much. Well, and over to BT. To BT. So your other question about Messianism, which is, is striking because I'm thinking, I'm thinking about it. I think that one of Idea's, for example, and also Libes, uh, Libes in the anniversary of, of Sholem, of his uh, 80s anniversary, uh, actually spoke about the Messiah of the Zohar, uh, rejecting Sholem's uh, claim that Messianism uh, just uh, uh, started in the 16th century and early Kabbalah just did, did dealt with creation and the, the 16th, from the 16th century Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism is colored by ma the messianic idea, showing that uh, there is a messianic idea also in the Zohar, in the Middle Ages and before the 16th century. I think most of their efforts of both Idel and Libes was to open up the concept of messianism. I think Idel does it in a lot of his books, actually showing us that messianism, the word messianism, the concept of messianism is so varied. It can speak about the political uh, redemption, it can speak about geographically, it can speak about the inner life, we're singing in Lecha Dodi, Karva El Nafshi Ge'ala, the nefesh can be, be uh, redeemed uh, as the Hasidic movement uh, strongly, some, some of them emphasize it, and Messian, Messianism is a very broad uh, concept, like you know Urbach, the, the, the big uh, scholar of Talmud, actually conclude, actually opens up uh, his uh, chapter about redemption in the Talmudic a time speaking about so varied ideas about about messianism inside the Talmud itself. I, I think that they try to actually uh, show uh, how this uh, concept is broad. And broad is to say, for example, that we're not just thinking about the linear apocalyptic uh, uh, way of, of, of messianism, but rather, for example, for, for the Ari, the, the ritual of, of prayer, uh, in the cycle of, of the day or the cycle of the week is a redeem, redemptive uh, a process. It's a cyclic and not a linearic, but each time uh, you do something, you create a kind of a little redemption. Of course, on Shabbat, Shabbat is the redemptive time uh, that you, you celebrate it seventh of your life. So in, in that way, you are trying, I think Sholem was fascinated by, by Messianism because of the Zionist idea. I think Noam spoke about it and also Tishbi calling himself Azai, you know, Azaiah the Tishbi. Um, but I think a, a, we are in a different, we're in different mode. We're not speaking about Messianism in that, in that way, a, in that subversive way on that apocalyptic and something that is breaking reality, but rather about more small redemptive moments. It has to do, as, as I described before, in the ritual of the cycle of life that also was a messianic moment. Uh, this time. So this is my uh, answer to your fascinating idea. I'm thinking about it. This messianism uh, is, 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 is in our research, is in our way of, of thinking about Kabbalah. And uh, as Noam uh, keeps telling us uh, about our life, uh, it's, it's a great uh, question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bitty. Um, looking, I'm looking at the time and looking at the questions that are coming in. I am going to share one question, which I think our panelists can, uh, if they so choose, answer very quickly and pointedly. And then with your forgiveness, I will have to call uh, the session to its end. So the question is from Sarah, who would like to know whether any of the panelists could recommend either a bachelor's or a master's program in Kabbalah in English? Is there a recognizable institute or university college that you could recommend in North America, Israel, uh, Europe, wherever you are most familiar? 
I think some of my friends that actually participated in this evening uh, teaches the uh, Kabbalah in America, uh, Lawrence Fine, maybe Lawrence Kaplan, uh, uh, Joel Hecker, Elliot Wolfson. Um, so plenty. Joel Hecker, I said, yeah, I think many, many people. I mean, I, I can't uh, say the entire list, uh, but uh, Cohen, many, many people are teaching Kabbalah in English. Yeah. Of um, course, Danny Matt and the Zohar that was translated is a, is a, is a amazing source for studying Kabbalah. Teach me the wisdom of the Zohar. So uh, let me maybe ask it more pointedly. Would there be, I mean, in when, Bitty, when you took uh, and you did your studies in Kabbalah, uh, I imagine you were able to major in the field, right? It wasn't just a course that you took. You could took a, a suite of courses, a program, an entire program in it. Is there something similar to that in the English language world? If you are a young student in Canada or North America or in Europe, uh, would you be able to engage in a, do a major or even a minor program in Kabbalah or you go to Israel? I'm saying come to Israel to study Kabbalah in its own language, Aramaic and Hebrew is of course uh, preferable, but okay, no, I'm sorry. No, but it is interesting that there are very bright and brilliant individuals that are teaching and researching Kabbalah in the US and in Europe, but there is no center, academic center for learning of or of teaching Kabbalah where you can also get uh, uh, or finish or graduate in this field. So I, I, I think that the, in Israel, no, the Hebrew University, Ben Gurion University uh, um, and Bar Ilan University. So, so there, those are the places that you could really uh, um, concentrate on, on that. Now, if they offer courses in English or not, this I don't know. Great, excellent. Thank you so much. And if there is more interest in getting such practical information about these programs, we are certainly very happy to facilitate the exchange. So uh, Sarah or other members in the audience who would like to uh, hear more or find out more about these things, please, by all means, uh, stay in touch with us and we would be able to, I'm very, very happy to facilitate. So uh, there are a number of thank yous I would like to share with you before I lose the, uh, the group uh, to virtual space. First and foremost, I would like to thank Rachel, Rachel Alkali, whose generosity and dedication to uh, helping students, um, helping our enterprise uh, in Israel studies on the Concordia campus uh, was of course the impetus for bringing together and convening this fascinating panel of three um, star researchers in the contemporary academic dis discipline of Kabbalah. So thank you very much, Rachel. We look forward to uh, the actual formal dedication, if you will, of the Zohar set in our reading room once we return to a, an entirely peaceful and quiet in-person operation on our campus. Secondly, I would like to thank Lisa Komlos and Corey Newman, my dedicated and able staff members at the Azriri Institute, whose um, never failing efforts and dedication make it possible all the time that we are meeting here in front of the, uh, in, the, in front of our computer screen. So thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Corey. And last but certainly not least, a huge and heartfelt thank you to Noam, Andrea, and Bitty, not only for accepting our invitation, not only for staying up so late in their respective time zones, but also taking the invitation so seriously by preparing and carefully reflecting in advance and on the spot about these very important issues that in Israel studies, we really don't engage often enough. And that's Hava, uh, because clearly there is a lot that Israel studies can and should benefit from uh, taking Kabbalah, its political, spiritual, but also academic dimensions more seriously. So thank you for your preparation. Thank you for sharing your erudition with us in such an eloquent manner as you did today. Um, friends, before I would say my final uh, goodbye and my final closing words, I do want to encourage you to please check out the exciting program that we have prepared for you in the month of March, very much continuing in the spirit of our anniversary celebration year. 
March is going to be Israeli Documentary Month here at the Azrieli Institute of Israel Studies. So over the course of four weeks, we will be bringing to your screens. You just need to register. They don't cost anything for you. We are subsidizing these movie screenings for fascinating recent and brand new uh, Israeli documentaries. The topics range from the Mossad to the trials and tribulations of the late Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, Apples and Oranges, which tells the story of the young foreign volunteers on Israeli kibbutzim, and also a film about the story of the zoo that once upon a time was in Tel Aviv. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, this is now time to call this meeting, this panel uh, to closure. I would like to thank everyone who stayed up and who joined in. Thank you for your interest, for your contribution, and we look forward to seeing you again at our future events here or there, but always at the Azrieli Institute of Israel Studies. Bye, everyone.